This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 410, recorded on October 7th, 2016. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. This episode is also sponsored by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, yet simple to use Storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobo.com to learn more. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. You getting a it, hurricane out there? No, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And I was just working on doing the conversion to Celsius. Oh, but it's 81, so it's pretty close to 27 Celsius, let's call it. We have so. 23 Celsius here, 50% humidity, gorgeous blue skies, really, really nice day. Mm -hmm. Let's find out what it's like around the rest of the country. Joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here, and it is glorious here. <laughs> I mean, it's it's New England autumn is just starting, and... I went up flying this morning, and it, it was perfectly stable air, and there was there was just a little bit of little patchy fog, and a couple of the valleys nestled up against the Holyoke Mountains, and and it was just really, really lovely. And I'm I'm rubbing this in because we're going to hear from some people where the weather is is normally much nicer than ours, and and it's not today. So yeah, it's gorgeous. Also joining us from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi everybody. Hi Rich. We, we have a hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> actually it's not bad at all uh, it, con uh considering that there's a hurricane going on uh it is 75 fahrenheit that's 24 and uh despite what was a uh, an unsettling forecast that really hasn't been too bad it's been about 20 miles an hour of wind gusts maybe up to 30 i'm kind of guessing here but it's an educated guess me being a sailor guy uh and it's gonna be dicey for the next uh four hours or so and then it's past us so we dodged a bullet i think yeah well you're not right on the coast either no 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 i mean uh, you know, people have questioned whether we were going to evacuate. And I said, where to, you know, right. Cause people evacuate to us cause we are, we're about as inland as you can get. Mm, well, we had wondered if, uh, you were going to make it here at all today. Uh, so we're glad that you're same. here and we're glad that your house is not damaged, which is important yeah. since you're about to yeah. sell it. <laughs> I, I fully expected the power to be out, but we haven't even had a problem with that. Great. Well, if you hear if you hear Rich going away during this episode, you'll know why. I, I suspect you won't. We, now, interestingly, uh, a good part of the of the people on this episode may not have made it because three of them, including Rich, are from Florida. That was great timing on my part, I guess. Uh, we have two guests from Florida Gulf Coast University. Sharon Eastern, welcome, Sharon. Hello. How's everybody doing? We're great, and Scott Michael, welcome. Hi, thanks very much, Vincent. You, and you are both in the same office there at uh, Florida. What's we, the name of the town that you're in? We're actually, we're in Fort Myers, Florida. We s did switch offices because I, I couldn't hear his echo anymore, so I kicked him out of my office. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, but you're not too far away. Fort no, Myers. just down the hall. Fort Myers. And um, we were, Rich and I were there a couple of years ago. That was episode 111. We recorded yes. that was, that there. That was the first Twiv Road Show. I remember and, that. And Alan uh, came in via Skype. Remember that? That's Alan? right. Yep, I was uh, projected on a big screen, which is a little Max Headroom moment there. Or Bill Gates at the, one of the Apple conferences. Oh right, remember yes. that? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was a lot of fun. But Sharon and Scott weren't on that episode, so we get a chance to talk to you today and tell us about the weather there. 
So we dodged the big one. We didn't really have too much trouble, even though the university uh, class uh, canceled classes yesterday and today. So faculty are out, you know, playing hooky and students are having fun. Uh, the weather today is 84 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 29 Celsius, partly cloudy. And I think the winds may be up to 17 mile an hour winds with a little bit of rain. And it's not as humid as it normally is. It's only 73% humidity. That's great. So as it's a great day. Yesterday afternoon, Kathy and Alan and I were frantically emailing, what are we going to do? They're all going to be not able to join us. Should we do an all email episode? <laughs> I'm glad that we're all here. And here in New York, the sun is streaming in. It's just, just gorgeous. So we're going to talk all about uh, you and your work. Before we get to that, <clears throat> just a couple of uh, follow up items. We have one follow up email. From Aya, who writes, Hi folks, Aya, pronounced Aya, here. <laughs> I must say, I really enjoyed you all struggling with the pronunciation of my name. <laughs> I realized my error in not providing a pronunciation note after I sent the email. I am female, by the way. And to Kathy, I did order the paperback form of Spillover. Excellent so far. Thank you for your responses to my question. I found it very helpful. Keep up the good work. I'm recommending you to all my virology friends. Kindest regards. Ah, oh, yeah. Cool. You could also recommend us to your non-virology friends. Yeah. you never know. You know, they may need to uh, learn some virology. All right. Now, you remember last time we announced the third giveaway of Viruses, an illustrated guide by Marilyn Rusink. And uh, I announced that last time, I don't know, how, towards the end of the episode, the 50th emailer would win the third copy. We haven't gotten there yet, so keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> Remind us, what do they have to put in the subject line? I love viruses. <laughs> subject That's all you have to do. Send an email to twiv at microbe.tv. Subject line, I love viruses. I'm not going to tell you how many we got so far because that wouldn't be fair. I also should say, if you tried the first two times, we had two winners previously, and you didn't make it, you can try again. That's fine. Yeah. And... There will be... Uh, enter as often as you like. Yeah, but not not for this. If you've already entered for this one, I don't think you Well, no, if you've enter, entered for this one, then. Yeah, right. but separately. And I have one more to give away, four copies, and we'll have a fourth contest. We'll think of something at some point to do that's a little bit different. So uh, some, I would guess in the next week or two, you you know, just I don't know, think about it. You're scientists, some of you. <laughs> you can figure it out. All right, a um, little bit of Zika... Sit rep. Now we have, uh, I don't know if you know this site, Sharon and Scott, there's a, I'm sure you do, you're in Florida. <laughs> this is the <laughs> Department of Health Daily Zika Update, which they started a while ago. And this is a great resource that, uh, who found? Kathy or Rich, I think, right? I found it. And uh, it gives you a summary of what's going on in Florida. Do you know this uh, site, Sharon and uh, Scott? Uh, yes, it's a, it's a great resource. It gives you daily what's going on. It's, it's, it's a good place to look for information. Um, it talks about reported cases, so it's, it's a little bit behind as far as um, yeah, yeah. incidents. But, but yeah, it's, it's, it's as good as it gets. Sharon, I think this is what you use to make that little chart that you... Right. right. If, if the, you dig into a little bit, you can actually get the arbovirus reports from there. You can get those uh, weekly as well, and it updates uh, how many local cases versus travelers versus um, positive mosquito pools are reported every week. Uh, Sharon, I think, used this to make a graph that, she's, yeah. uh, that she sent. And I wanted to know whether um, it, uh, whether the case count, weekly case count, is pretty much level, Sharon. Do you know? Uh, no, actually, or, it, it hasn't leveled off yet. Right now, we have, um, for the last week that was reported, which was the week of September 25th to October 1st, uh, cumulative, there's uh, 783 travelers' cases, 133 cumulative local transmission. Now, for the week itself, there were 41 traveler cases and 28 locally transmitted cases. Mm. Uh, so it, it it looks like the uh, the local transmission has not died down. The travelers' cases, I think there was a, a we had looked on the graph. There was a big um, sort of a peak. I think we thought maybe that correlated to folks going on vacation for the summer months and coming back. And, and then it's uh -huh. pretty much hasn't gone down. It's, it's, it's gone down since that peak, but, but it's, it's still there. Uh, 41 cases reported last week. 
28 in a week is uh, relative to what's going on in the past, a fairly large number. It is. And I was actually doing the numbers just overall, and I calculated that 15% of the cases of Zika in Florida are from local transmission. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Now, okay. when you get those numbers, do you know when they occurred or just samples that come in and get analyzed? So the 28 in the past week, you don't know if, when they occurred exactly, right? Right. We don't know when they occurred. We just know they were reported that past week. Yeah. So the, it could be a little misleading in terms of the rate, right? Yeah. Right. I am happy to see, though, on the um, uh, the Florida Health website that they are now mentioning the out-of-state cases, the people who probably got it in Florida and then went home and were diagnosed. They're putting them in a separate category, but previously mm-hmm. they weren't even mentioning those. Yeah. Yeah. Happened. Yep. Now, uh, and it's still, it's still combined to, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah. confined to Miami-Dade, is that right? Um, as far as local transmission? Yeah. Yes. Uh, most of it is in Miami-Dade County. There was uh, one uh, local transmitted case, case in Pinellas, which is the Tampa area. There have been several in Palm Beach, Beach County as well, and a couple okay. um, initially in Broward County. But most of them are from Miami-Dade. Hmm. Okay. Now, what do you think? Is there going to be an impact of the hurricane on, on any of this? We were wondering about that. Um, not sure. I mean, obviously, it's going to bring more rain, more winds, um, maybe the possibility of the mosquitoes um, being blown to mm-hmm. other places. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, and also a um, lot of a uh, lot of containers with water left over afterward. Oh, absolutely. Sites. Yes. Yeah. 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 For sure. <laughs> All right. I will talk more about Zika in a bit um, with Sharon and Scott. I wanted to tell everyone about a site I found this week while working on this episode. It's a Pan American Health Organization site, uh, which has a monthly summary, basically a regional update. This is for the Americas, of course. Um, They have 47 countries and territories in the America have confirmed autochthonous vector-borne transmission since 2015. Five countries, this is all Americas now, five countries have reported sexually transmitted cases. And overall, you know, they go through the different countries. Uh, overall transmission or reporting, at least, is downward. Mexico, downward trend of confirmed cases. Uh, Costa Rica, Panama, downward trend. Costa Rica hasn't varied much. Uh, you know, so they go through a lot of the countries. Overall, the transmission rates are down. They also have a nice table showing uh, the numbers of cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome and other neurological disorders. So there are a number of countries where they have an increase in Guillain-Barre with Zika virus lab confirmation, Brazil, Colombia, DR, El Salvador, French Guiana, Guadalupe, Honduras, Jamaica, Martinique, Suriname, and Venezuela. Uh, And then they have um, cases where there's no Zika virus confirmation in Paraguay, St. Vincent, and the Granadas. So that's pretty cool. It's a nice site. Every month they have an update and they have have an archive of all the past updates as well. And sometimes they have graphs for the different countries as well. And the the decline is what you might expect either because of uh, better control measures or possibly more likely in many of these places, the the epidemic is just burning itself out because there aren't any susceptible hosts left. One more thing I wanted to note, congenital syndromes associated with infection. To date, 16 countries and territories in the America have reported confirmed cases of congenital syndrome associated with infection. It's the same total as last month. Uh, Canada has reported two maternal fetal transmissions of virus, one with severe neurological anomalies. And they have another, they have a uh, table with the number of confirmed cases of congenital syndrome published on a weekly basis. Uh, on another page on the website, which they link to, which is quite good. Now they say, um, so congenital syndrome associated with Zika virus infection. So mother tests positive for Zika virus antibodies, I assume, and baby has some kind of malformation consistent with what we think the virus might cause. The Canada thing I'm a little confused by because they refer to maternal fetal transmissions of Zika virus. Did they actually test the I mean, what are they testing for there? Oh no, I don't know what they did. It's one case, yeah. There's yeah. no, there's no information here. I didn't hunt it down. Okay, one more thing uh, sent by Anthony. It is uh, from the uh, Assembly Democrats in New Jersey. <laughs> 
There's a bill called the Share and Preto Bill to help New Jersey combat spread of Zika virus. It advances in the assembly. Okay, New Jersey, that's nice, but advancing is, you know, let's just do it. (laughs) Pass the bill. (laughs) I'll have some words later on uh, the uh, Congress bill that was passed by the U.S., but it's nice. Yes, go ahead. The main thing about this bill, it says that they're requiring the Department of Health to develop a Zika virus state action plan. <laughs> okay. So. I can help them with that. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm a little, I, I don't try to second guess legislative priorities because I know, I don't want to know the process that sets those. But um, it, Zika virus in New Jersey, uh, how big a concern is this relative to some of the other vector-borne diseases that they could be addressing? I was having the same problem, Alan. <laughs> Okay. Well, I think this all began, you know, a long time ago before we knew what was going to happen over the summer. So right. maybe this is the remnant of that. Okay. Uh, and, and now we need, we realize, you know, there's not huge spread within the U.S. It's mainly Florida. but um, Particularly not in temperate climates that have cold winters. If they would like to establish a little research fund to sure, fund, not be- <laughs> fund research, especially by residents of New Jersey, yeah. <laughs> I think that would be an excellent idea. And you know, well, you know, I'm that's, f- what that's not what's in their that's not what's in their bill. I know, no. I know that it's not in the bill, <laughs> but I'm saying there are right. precedents for that. In fact, there is a cancer research fund that is used to fund people in New Jersey, and so uh, I, I was on the study section of that a number of years ago. So. Um, if they're listening, you know there are a number of virologists in New Jersey who are working on Zika well, virus. Well, call your call your um, assembly you representative bet. and uh, get get a uh, little sh- thing put in. Sharon, Sharon, and Michael, I I kind of expect that Zika epidemiologically would follow a pattern similar to dengue. Is that correct thinking? I think that's a that's a pretty good thing to to guess. Um, Zika also has the sexually transmitted components, so it might be a little bit different in that sense. But okay. we have a little bit of uh, experience with dengue outbreaks in Florida, and we can kind of think about Zika along those same lines. Right. So the reason I'm bringing that up is that uh, dengue hasn't made it very far north, correct? No, we've had um, in the past few years we've had an outbreak of dengue in Key West, and then another smaller outbreak in um, Martin County, which is on the east coast, north of uh, north of Miami. Um, and then there's a scattering of a few uh, non-travel related cases every year. It seems like I think we've got one so far this year, um, and you know, I think two now. Two, um, yeah. Yeah, too. And um, yeah, it doesn't seem to really take off and go for multiple years. The the Key West outbreak seemed to go for, for maybe two years and then um, kind of petered out after that. Hasn't there okay. been some chikungunya there as well, or was, there, or was that all travel related? Yeah, there were a few um, uh, local cases, it seemed like, but it didn't really go anywhere. Okay. So we're, we're kind of poking fun at New Jersey for this initiative, but what about other states? Is Are there within... Florida initiatives to get some money for uh, for various aspects of Zika. Yeah, there there sure are. Um, I think our our governor Rick Scott got pretty frustrated with the uh, federal people and uh, decided to release twenty five million in uh, Zika research funds. And uh, now the Department of Health is putting together a request for proposals, and um, we're going to certainly submit some applications to do some interesting Zika work down here. Great. Excellent. And and presumably there's money uh, that's been allocated for control as well. Yeah, the the state allocate, allocated some money um, for the Department of Health, the Department of Agriculture, and for the Mosquito Control Districts. And um, right. that, that's been ongoing. Yeah, this is the first release of funds for research, though. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So last thing before we start talking with uh, Scott and Sharon about them. Uh, I, I have a new design of a Twiv mug. You, do you see that in the show notes, everyone? Mm-hmm. Yes. That is pretty cool. Do you like it? I it's like nice. it. The reason I'm doing this is because our supporters over on Patreon, uh, at certain reward levels, at certain levels of, of donation, they get a reward, and one of them is a mug ah. <laughs> from the podcast of their choice. So I'm making Twiv, Twip, Twim, Twivo, et cetera, mugs. And um, so I tried to keep them simple. And that's uh, that's one design um, that I'm doing. And then I think 
Uh, I have to do T-shirts also because I promised some people T-shirts as well. And I'm going to bring some of these to meetings like ASV. I'll bring a bunch and we can give them away. So cool. That'll be fun. And, and I, I have a classic TWIV mug. Is that now a collector's item? It's a collector's <laughs> item. It's worth a lot Great. of money on eBay. They're going for, uh, for tons of money. And Sharon and, and Scott, you both, I think you both have TWIV mugs. I, I'm right? still, I'm looking at my TWIV mug. I have it right here on my windowsill. <laughs> I have mine as well. And, and I think it would look very nice accompanied by a new one. Yeah. Sure. So I'm going to do what I can to make that happen. <laughs> you know, we could just send you some because you're guests on our show. That's uh, I, I think it's, it's also, uh, I could also donate, so... <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. Uh, so Sharon and Scott, uh, since you weren't on TWIV before, we never learned about your histories, and we always love to do that on TWIV. So why don't you tell us, you know, where you grew up and where you're educated and you know, how, your path to uh, where you are now. Uh, Sharon, let's start with you. Sure. Um, so I'm originally from Puerto Rico. Um, I did my undergraduate in chemical engineering from the Johns Hopkins University and then worked for a while as a, as a chemi. Um, for Exxon and Procter and Gamble, I made some soap and I designed refineries, so that was kind of fun. And then I decided Ooh. to go to grad school. Uh, hang on, hey, wait, wait. What's, what's an ME? <laughs> Too much going. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. What, what what's an ME? A chemi, chemical chemi, engineer. Chemi. Oh, chemi, chemi, chemi. Okay, chemical yeah. engineer. Okay. So yeah. you you never worked on a an oil rig, did you? Not an oil rig, but I helped to design refineries. Um, in, in, in Europe and South America. Yeah. I was off based off of uh, New Jersey, Florham Park, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, neat. Yeah, so that was kind of fun. And then, um, and then I decided to go to grad school, um, sort of work on smaller machines and got my PhD in, in biochemistry. I started at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and um, my advisor um, got a position at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, so I ended up moving with the lab and getting my PhD from UAB, and then um, who was your advisor? Uh, David Curiel. Okay. Uh, working on gene therapy vectors, I was working with uh, targeted gene delivery with adenovirus vectors, mm-hmm. and then um, did some postdoc work um, with uh, Tom Broker and Louise Chow, uh, working on human papillomavirus at UAB for a couple of years, and then um, moved to Tulane, um, uh, where Scott got his first faculty position. So we moved there as a family, and I. Uh, I worked in the Department of Tropical Medicine um, as a research assistant professor, and eventually, I guess, when was that, Scott? 2004, speaking Four, of hurricanes, yeah. yeah, just in time for Hurricane Charlie, we moved here. <laughs> um, but we to, missed Katrina, which was we important. We missed Katrina, which yes. was the following year, yes. Um, Good we timing. Moved here. Yep, perfect timing, and um, have been. Uh, we both got recruited, um, got independent faculty positions, and have been working here for I guess thirteen years now. Um, oh, we, no. <laughs> yeah, I know we're getting pretty old. Um, we do all of our research with undergraduate students. We've had some postdocs here and there, but uh, we're our primarily undergraduate institution, and we you know, have a pretty heavy teaching load, and and we. We involve our undergraduates in, in the research um, effort. So that's that's kind of my, my story in a nutshell. How many students Good are at, at Florida Gulf Coast? Ooh, um, I'm going to get the number wrong, uh, Scott. We're about 15,000 15, now. 15? Yeah. yeah not, oh. not so small anymore, but it was yeah. tiny when we came here and, and you know, nothing like uh, building a new university. Hmm. When, you, when, you, <laughs> when you went, it was relatively new? Was yeah, it was it was uh, much was much smaller. Started in 1996. Yeah, yeah, so we're yeah. Wow. So Sharon, you came. You went to high school in Puerto Rico. Is that right? Uh, yes, I actually went to um, Antilles High School in Fort Buchanan. It's mm. uh, for children of military employees and the federal um, government personnel. Well, you must have done. And what well. br- what brought you to the U.S.? Yeah, um, yeah. Education, career <laughs> opportunities. So you applied to Hopkins from Puerto Rico and got in, right? Uh, yes, I did. Yeah. You must have done well in high school. Um, good scholarships and financial aid yeah. helped out a lot too. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Cool. Scott, where are you from? I'm from Chicago originally. Uh, so, um, yeah, Midwestern. And, uh, I went to school out in Iowa, uh, did my undergraduate at Cornell college, a little liberal arts school out in the middle of Iowa, which was great. Uh, worked well for me cause I needed the lack of distractions there. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, after that, I went and um, did my PhD in uh, chemistry in uh, Jeremy Berg's lab in, at Hopkins and uh, met Sharon there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he was not a TA for any of my classes. Yeah. I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> it's okay. 
<laughs> but but I did ask some of her TAs what she was like when I was <laughs> thinking about uh, asking her out. But uh, yeah. Um, after that, I guess we uh, we followed uh, Sharon's career and uh, went to UNC at Chapel Hill and uh, then to University of Alabama at Birmingham. So I worked with Ron Swanstrom um, on HIV protease resistance, protease inhibitor resistance, mm-hmm. and then went to UAB and worked with Eric Hunter for a little while and then also worked with Beatrice Hahn on uh, the origin of HIV. Nice. Wow. Uh, yeah. That's great. Yeah, wow. And I think you've heard the rest of the story from Sharon. Yeah. So. Yeah. so I would. Scott, Scott I, uh, sure, I, had a, I had a friend who was a deanlet of sorts at Cornell. How big was Cornell? Uh, Cornell is, was, when I was there, it's even smaller than it is now. Um, it was 800 and something students when I was wow. there. Uh, so this guy's name was Jim Brown. Uh, Jim Don't Brown. Suppose. Okay. Right. No, I no. don't remember. Okay. I don't remember him, but I was there a right. long time ago, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've been around for a long time, and Jim Brown is my age. So, okay. Anyway. I was just okay. at I was just at uh, UNC Chapel Hill a couple of weeks ago. Did two twivs there, mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, actually three. Uh, one with Joe Pagano, and yeah. uh, I just met Rich, Rich Whitley this past yesterday. In fact, in Boston or the day before, and I'm trying to snaggle an invitation to Birmingham to do a twiv with him because i think that would be interesting he's got an interesting he must have been there when you were there right Sharon? yes he yeah, was he sure. was yeah we actually yeah. have a couple of undergraduates that um just started a phd program at uab so they would love to see if you go over there and do a twiv yeah i i think he would be a really interesting uh, guest he's done a lot of interesting things which most of us don't do you know he's been involved in antivirals a lot and uh mm-hmm. and he's also a very interesting guy so that would be fun so you you're at an undergraduate institution. There are no that means there are no doctoral programs there, right? Well, we do have a couple of doctoral programs, yeah. but nothing really in uh, biological sciences. So okay, do you have a master's in in biology at all? No, we've got no. a master's in environmental sciences, uh, but uh, we're talking about uh, developing a master's degree program in biology. But mm-hmm. um, we'll we'll see whether it happens or not anytime soon. Do you do a lot of teaching? Uh, yeah, I think both Sharon and I do um, a, a good deal of teaching. Um, mm-hmm. We've been mostly teaching um, the a, a virus, a phage hunters course, which is right. uh, the sea phages program right. through HHMI and uh, University of Pittsburgh. That's right, Sharon. You were you and I were corresponding about getting out there at some point in some summer and and doing a twiv, right? Right. Yeah. So we were um, Scott and I were uh, course directors for the the sea phages program. Um, virus discovery workshops over the summer in Baltimore, and we basically brought in how many schools, Scott? Twenty institutions newly recruited to the CFAGES program, and and work with them on how to set up the courses at their schools. And we're currently just following up with them to see how they're doing through virtual site visits. And it looks like they're all doing well, and they're all yeah. getting phage. They're they're doing great doing virus discovery. So you do this at, at your uh, university? You have students go out and find their own phages. Yes. Where do they they go in their backyards? Are they anywhere they'd like? Doesn't matter. Anywhere, anywhere, they, anywhere like. they want. Yeah. The only thing is they need to come back with GPS coordinates, so it can't be anywhere illegal. <laughs> 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 what would be an illegal place, for example? Oh, I don't know. A national park, see, a monument, or, yeah. yeah government Toxic installation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Military installation. <laughs> there how you did go. You, how did you get there? Don't, don't ask. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. So, as I, as I recall, another thing about uh, Florida Gulf Coast University, as I recall, uh, there is no tenure, right? There is no tenure. We are all, all faculty are on three-year rolling contracts. And so, every year we get evaluated. And if we meet expectations, the contract gets extended for another three years. Mm-hmm. We do mm-hmm. go through the promotion process from assistant to associate to full, but not through the tenure system. So we still have very to put a portfolio and, and, and we get raises. That's good. Yeah, yes, very sometime. interesting. <laughs> I remember that from our last visit. What, and I think when we did the TWIV down there, that was, you had your one of your classes uh, attended. Yes, that, TWIV, that was right? actually my virology class attended, mm-hmm. yes. Okay. So you said uh, that you do your research mainly with undergraduates. So at any given time, both of you have separate laboratories. You have separate undergrads. How, roughly how many would you have in your lab? Well, we have um, all research facilities at Florida Gulf Coast University are shared. So Mm -hmm. we we share a lab with other investigators as well. And so as far as numbers, 
Um, I think right now we're on the slimmer side. Um, Scott, help me count them up here. Are we f- yeah, five? Yeah, fingers. We usually run around 10 people or so. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah sometimes we get more. We just had a, a batch of them graduate and move on to graduate programs. Um, but yeah, typically between the two of us, we'll have anywhere between six to even 12 um, students. And I guess you recruit them through your classes mainly, right? Uh, yes, that's that's typically how we do it. Um, we both have been teaching the our, one of our core courses in biological sciences is cell biology, and we do mammalian cell culture laboratories there. And so we, we can kind of see who has good hands and who's inter- interested and mm-hmm. excited about it. Then we bring them on as teaching assistants, uh, typically volunteers to come and help um, teach other sections of the class. And, and then after that, it's a matter of helping them learn how to do cell culture in a containment facility with viruses. But yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's been great. Um, the good thing about undergraduate students is, is you can train them and, and, you know, they're, um, they're willing to learn, they're eager, and they don't come in with bad habits. <laughs> <laughs> so I was uh, with a shared laboratory and uh, a gaggle of uh, undergraduates. Is there, uh, do you find any issues with working with live virus? Uh, you know, any issues of biohazards? Uh, no, we, we go through, um, we individually train each and every one of them. We have a very rigorous um, training program. Um, we've been inspected um, and so we, you know, we've uh, we've had no issues. I mean, as with any virus lab, sometimes you have a little spill here and there. But the important thing is that they know how to deal with them, how to report it, and how to clean things up and and be safe about it. So no, we haven't really had any any issues. And and we screen the students very carefully. We don't just, you know, it's not just if they're interested. They also have to have the skill set to be able to perform at that level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have a, a lot of we have a, a fairly stringent selection procedure, and our our biosafety facility is uh, separate from the the main laboratory and has a card key swipe access and things like that. So it's okay. not like we just have classrooms of students wandering through. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. So of the of all the students that have worked in your lab over the years, you said some of them go on to PhD students at uh, programs. What? Lots, what, what, yeah. I guess some go to medical school, right? Right. We actually have most of them end up either in, so we've had vet school um, students, mm-hmm. med school, PhD programs, um, physician's assistance program, and some go straight into industry. Great. So you really... This, this actually kind of reminds me a lot of where I went to undergrad many, many years ago at, in Maryland, Towson yeah. State University. Yeah. They, Towson State, very, uh, yeah. Very similar. Now it's just Towson University, but... Um, a similar setup where they they had undergrads select group of undergrads and you would have your faculty mentor and and it was very small groups who would do research in in the labs um nothing quite as interesting as zika i'm afraid but uh, <laughs> <laughs> i'm no, sure Towson's, i'm sure Towson's a great school i'm sure alan that you recognize uh, their contribution to your career by generous donations on an annual basis I actually do uh, <laughs> donate. I, I donate, um, but I earmark the donation for the debate team. <laughs> okay. Which I, I, I'm sorry, but it actually had a bigger influence on my career trajectory. Yeah, um, yeah you want to argue yeah. about that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alan uh, was a contentious student. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, okay, so we, we, I want to talk about two things uh, with... Uh, Sharon and Scott. One of them is your paper, which we uh, originally saw on BioArchive back in April right. of 2016, all about uh, ad- antibody-dependent enhancement. It's called Dengue Virus Antibodies Enhanced Zika Virus Infection. So maybe you could tell us, uh, you're, you're both Dengue Virus Laboratories primarily. Is that correct? Would that be a correct statement? Yes. And so uh, yep. what, what, why did you decide to do this and and you did it, of course, all with undergraduates, and of which there are a bunch on this paper. So tell us the history of this. Sharon, you want to go ahead? Uh, uh, you can go ahead. I'll jump in. <laughs> well, I, I guess uh, you know Zika is a close relative of dengue, and so working on uh, some people call it the the fifth dengue even. Um, so it was kind of a natural thing when we saw it coming through and, and it was you know going to come through the, the new world in South and Central America. It's pretty much only a, a matter of time, we thought, till it shows up in Florida and uh, we better get on it. So we, we got some Zika virus and we started playing around and we noticed that... When was know, this our, roughly? At the big- oh, this is, um, let's see, 
before the, before January. It ago? was last year. Yeah, uh, a couple. Okay. Of, yeah. So so yeah, you were in years ago before it was cool. Yeah, uh, well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Careful, we don't get burned by it. Um, so, and we what we what we noticed is a lot of our Zika re, our uh, dengue research had been on antibodies and the antibody response, and so we noticed right off the bat that a bunch of our um, human monoclonal antibodies that we had made with John Shefflin and James Robinson over at Tulane, um, they re reacted with Zika really strongly, and so you know we immediately thought to ourselves, ah, okay, is is there going to be a problem here? Because uh, you know the main the big problem with a, making a dengue vaccine is that. You have these four serotypes, and the antibody response you get from having been infected with one of them leaves you with these antibodies that make subsequent infections with other serotypes worse through this antibody-dependent enhancement effect where um, the antibodies decorate the outside of the virus, but they don't neutralize it, and instead they target the virus particles to macrophages and other FC receptor-bearing cells. So, um, we saw right off the bat that these Zika viruses are not neutralized by a lot of dengue antibodies, um, some that people have reported, but primarily it, it seems these dengue antibodies seem to enhance Zika infections. And so, we just set out to do some what I think are fairly simple-minded experiments in uh, human FC receptor-bearing cells just to see what uh, Zika virus infections looked like with and without human antibodies. In your paper, you say that the fusion loop uh, in these viruses is uh, absolutely conserved. Is that correct? Across dengue and Zika? Right. So, well, it depends on exactly what you call the fusion loop, but if there's well, yeah, that's what that's what I was after. I wanted to know how big that fusion loop was. Yeah, if you if you just define it as a little ten ang ten uh, amino acid loop at the very very tip, which is that harpoon, the hydrophobic harpoon that sticks into the cell membrane, um, that is absolutely conserved. If you're talking about some of the other areas that are structurally spatially near there, there's some some differences in um, you know between flavor viruses in the actual structure near that fusion loop. But it's not extreme. There's, there's quite a bit of conservation in that area in almost all flaviviruses. And the monoclonal antibodies and even the polyclonal antibodies, are they targeted to that region? A lot of them. It, it turns out that if you if you look at mice, it's different. Mice make a lousy uh, model for dengue and maybe for Zika as well. But um, the human antibody response really is Primarily, that neutralizing response is primarily directed against the uh, fusion loop. So cross-reactivity makes perfect sense. It, it does. These are common antibodies that almost everybody that who's ever looked at uh, human antibodies against dengue or Zika has found. Um, yeah, so cross-reactivity makes perfect sense. So this, this paper was published in BioArchive back in April. And the cool thing about BioArchive, you can go there and see all the social metrics, all the blogs and the Twitter, Facebook, blah, 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 yeah. news pickups. It's pretty cool. We, I picked it up right away, wrote a blog post. We talked about it on uh, TWIV as well. Why, yeah. did you, why did you decide to uh, put it at BioArchive? Well, um, the World Health Organization said we should. I thought that was a pretty good reason. Um, <laughs> That's compelling. You know, this, this is an outbreak. Um, Zika is is expanding and, and moving and infecting, and it's it's killing babies. And, um, you know, what better reason to get information out there early than in the midst of an outbreak that's that's really, um, you know, having a horrible impact on people's lives. Mm -hmm. So we kind of thought that uh, in, in addition to being a, a new interesting way to publish, you know, this is absolutely the right thing to do. And I, I kind of don't understand why other people during outbreaks don't put their data out there right away. Mm. Well, BioArchive is a relatively recent development, right? True. Yeah. Uh, but yes, it, it does seem like something that is uh, ideally suited. This may be the killer app for BioArchive. So I haven't seen this published yet. What's going on, Sharon? So we submitted it on the same day that we posted to BioArchives to a journal, to Plus neglected tropical diseases, um, and we ended up getting a rejection from that journal. It took a, a few months. Um, I guess we posted on the 25th, and August 6th is when we finally got our decision. Um, so that took a while. But something that was um, 
in the meantime, while our paper was in in peer review with that journal, uh, an editor from another journal was just kind of lurking around by our archives and found our post and approached me through email and said, hey, I'm really interested in this paper. Have you submitted it for publication anywhere? And so, and the reason I bring that up is because I think that this may be where um, we might need to go with 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 signs and, and, and publications where the authors put their best data and information that they have from their labs out there in 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 these posts such as by archives or some other ones and editors can come and take a look and see okay well what is it that my journal is looking for and sort of um, the and maybe even fight over which you know papers they they want to put into their journal so the competition instead of going one way where um, investigators are trying to um, get into different journals, the journals can maybe compete with each other for the best science. Hmm. That's an interesting right. idea. I hadn't thought yeah. of that. Yeah. I like that. So we ended up submitting to this particular journal, um, um, clinical and translational immunology, and it's gone through peer review. It's been accepted conditionally. Um, and we just have to um, make a few revisions and, and, and send it back in, but it, it looks like um, it's going to get into that one. Great. Cool. Is it essentially the same as the bioarchive paper? It's pretty much the same. There was some additional data. Um, we, when we posted the by archive paper, the American strains of Zika were not readily available, and so we we did all our work with um, the African strain, um, MR seven six six, and so we basically redid everything on top of that, um, or some of the assays with. Um, a Puerto Rican strain, a recent isolate from Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, nice. There were some additional comments that were so. So we we added a little bit more data, but in essence, the it didn't change the story. It was it was still the same. There were really no no major differences between the antibody dependent enhancement with the 766 strain and the uh, American strain. They mm -hmm. were pretty much the same. If, so, if anything, uh, people, the enhancement. Oh, sorry. The, if anything, the enhancement was greater with uh, the Puerto Rican strain. Okay. People can comment on BioArchive. Is that yeah, correct? Sure. Yes. You can. Did those yes. comments? Did those comments influence your revisions at all? Oh, absolutely. Um, comments. Um, so, Vincent, you had actually talked about doing some experiments to look at the actual replication of the virus, not just looking at genome copies or genome equivalents, but looking to see, you know, do you get plaques? And um, even before we got um, anything back from the reviewers, we were already doing that experiment. And so we, you know, it, it was instant feedback. It was actually, I thought it was great. I thought the process of going through posts in a bio archive and getting scientists and colleagues who are interested in the science to comment and give you good feedback that you can use to make your your science stronger i mean that I, I was all about that and so we mm -hmm. we started acting on that immediately so by the time that we did get the reviews back to you know resubmit the first time or whatnot we already had data in hand to put it in um so i thought that was great um i mean this one out it got tweeted out it got blogged it went through the media and you know if, if you're keeping tracks of scores it, it was pretty amazing i mean the i, I didn't really know what it at at metric score meant until we posted and you know since it went in it just kept clicking and clicking <laughs> and uh it, to this to i i think i just looked a couple of days ago the manuscript was still in the 99th percentile of all tracked research outputs mm, um right. compared so far so i i mean i thought that and, and so it surprised me actually that even with that, to get that rejection. But of course, we've all had experiences where we submit somewhere and it's not liked, and then you submit pretty much, in essence, the same paper to another journal, and they say it's great, and you know, it, it is what it is. But it was nice to have peer review out um, where it was not a clandestine kind of thing where you can actually see who was talking, who was saying what, and it was just, um, I mean, maybe science should move in that direction where it's not behind closed doors that you actually are able to talk to a colleague uh, and let them know how what you think about their science without hiding behind that, you know, veil of peer review. So maybe we should grudgingly admit that the physicists actually had a good idea at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have always said it's a great idea. I love it. Uh, I think it's really good. And I think that we, when review, as Sharon says, when reviews are not anonymous, the tone is very different because yes. mm -hmm. you look at the tone of many, many reviews, man, they're insulting, right? Yeah. 
I've had many. Now, that's not to say that internet comments are the um, uh, the gold standard of no, intelligent no, discussion, all. but uh, but when people are, and certainly there are going to be comments on this from from random eggs on Twitter who you, you don't need to listen to. Um, but when somebody is posting under their own Twitter account or on their own blog about this, and you know who it is, they're going to tend to give you um, uh, rational ideas that could, as in this case, uh, help inform your, your yeah. future research. I think also there's some journals where the the reviews are signed, and uh, they're actually yeah. published with the paper. And right. so, you know, you have to you have to be decent once you do that. You can't be yes. nasty, and I think that's really important. Um, the one thing I would caution about, though, with the um, uh, the idea that Sharon suggested with journals, then trolling bio archive to find papers they'd like to publish, it it sounds like a great idea, and obviously that can work out. Um, but authors who are doing that would, of course, have to be aware that there are sharks in those particular waters. Um, these predatory open access journals, especially that uh, have essentially no peer review, and they're just trolling for sure, page sure, fees. Sure. Um, Absolutely, you know. So, uh, so Sharon, in the meantime, a couple of other groups have published uh, similar findings, right? Right, right. Although you do have the first publication date on BioArchive. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know what that gets, but... I yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure either, so as, as we're hopefully going <laughs> to be publishing $5 buys you a coffee soon. At Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about it. I'm just. I guess the the next step is 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 if this process is going to continue with with posting in 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 these different archives. So how is that going to work? So is is the date of publication the date you know that the journal puts on it, or does it get linked back up to the bio way, archive post date? How does that the way work? The, right. My understanding of the way the physicists do it is that the date that you put it on archive um, is that's that's the principal date of the. Uh, um, for whoever wants to claim priority, because mm -hmm. and, and certainly from a stand, from say a patent law standpoint, uh, you will have published the prior art, and at that point, nobody can say that they didn't know about it. I would also say that if your <clears throat> if your uh, published paper is pretty similar to the bioarchive version, if anyone writes a review article and they don't, you know, cite you among the earliest reporters right. of this, they, they're wrong. And it's going to take a while to get around this, I think, but that they'll have to say, you know, this, this was the first uh, report of this. Right. I've, yeah. I've been watching that, actually, and there have been a number of reviews of the area, and, and most of the other papers that are published that are peer-reviewed are the ones that are being cited. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think that may be just a, a cultural remnant. We'll see whether that goes away yeah, or not, and right, people start right. to actually cite bioarchives. Right. Now, of course, this could also, I'm, I'm, as the resident cynic, I'm, I'll also point out that people could game the system by putting up crummy bioarchive papers just to kind yeah. of stake out territory yeah. on something. Yeah. But presumably the community will come to a conclusion with uh, uh, the first legitimate findings of this were from so-and-so. Alan, do you know how the physicists might indicate this on their CV, for example? Or maybe I some don't. listener knows and can let us yeah, know. Yeah, I'm sure we have listeners who, who are more familiar with that process who could, because uh, I know in, in different subfields of physics and math, there are different traditions as well, going back many, many decades where people would actually physically mail their paper out to a dozen colleagues and, and ask for feedback. And it wasn't peer review. It was more like a sort of a publication um, and I think in some cases that might even have established priority because there were so few people in the field. Obviously, the scale of biological research as an enterprise is vastly larger, and we're going to have to come up with our own traditions for this. Scott, you said uh, in the beginning that you did this because it was an outbreak topic. But if, mm -hmm. you know, in the future, you're not always going to be working on outbreak science. Would you nevertheless put your paper on BioArchive again? Oh, I, I think that's really going to depend. So um, a good example, we're working on um, some other things that have intellectual property associated with them that a company has right. licensed. And so, you know, we're certainly not going to put that sort of stuff up on BioArchive just because, you know, then you lose your patent rights, things like that. Right. But, you know, I think if it's a piece of information that can actually have an effect uh, on how people view or, or manage a uh, a, a, an outbreak that's occurring currently, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's really important to get that out there. Mm. 
Yeah, one of the things that I thought was really important is, I mean, we did the study um, of antibody-dependent enhancement. It's, it's all in vitro. And what I did want to, one of the reasons I wanted to get it out there is because I wanted physicians and clinicians and, and people who have access to patients to start taking a look and maybe if, if getting patient history and asking them about pre-existing conditions such as have you ever had a dengue infection, if, if that wasn't making it into right. the regular questionnaire, I, you know, I thought that maybe getting this out there would get people asking. So I've gotten, for example, emails from physicians approaching me and saying, hey, I've, I've seen this with my patients. I, I wanted to let you know that, you know, we are seeing this, um, a patient who had dengue um, um, and then ended up with Zika, uh, had um, um, clinical manifestations that were maybe more similar to a, like a dengue hemorrhagic fever kind of thing. And so, so these different things were popping up. And so to me, I just... As the outbreak was happening, getting the information and having people do those follow-up studies, uh, clinical and epidemiological studies, and, and figure out is this really going on or not, and and, and if it's only an in vitro effect, when that is, good, it's good to know that too. Right, and that's actually a really epidemiologically. That's going to be a really interesting question. Yeah. Um, are there differences in infection based on whether you've had dengue? And of course. Everywhere we've seen Zika so far, there's pretty much already been dengue, so we can't do <laughs> the overall population look, but maybe some of these traveler cases, uh, which people didn't have dengue before and they got Zika as their first exposure to these viruses, um, those might be informative yep. comparing right. to, to this, others. This might have a, a big impact on whether or not, for example, Zika takes hold in New Jersey. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. That's a very important issue, especially with yep. winter coming. We're all concerned about that. Yeah. The other, the other topic I wanted to speak with Sharon and Scott about is uh, your work with the state of Florida on finding Zika virus in mosquitoes. Can you tell us about that? I don't know. Yeah, so so we've been um, we've had a long-standing collaboration with the Miami-Dade Mosquito Control um, and and with other mosquito c control districts, and so when. Um, when a lot of travelers' cases started popping up in in Florida, Miami Dade um, um, so uh, approached us to to ask to for us to help them screen their mosquitoes, and we had been involved in, and this is one of the things that um, the TWIB 111 um, that was about the dengue virus outbreak back in 2009 2010. So we had worked with other mosquito control districts. In that particular instance, it was the um, Florida Keys mosquito control from Monroe County down in Key West area. And so, you know, we've had these collaborations and in that instance, we were testing mosquitoes for dengue. And so when Zika came around, um, Miami did asked us if we were willing to look at uh, Zika for them in their mosquito pools. In the past, we had also tested mosquitoes from Miami-Dade for both dengue virus and chikungunya. And so this was not an unusual request. And so when they approached us again, we said, sure, let's go ahead and do it. I believe we started screening their mosquitoes um, in, in June of this year. Um, and, um, Late and May, so, early June, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think I have June 6th was the uh, twenty. First was the first pool that we screened for them, um, and then once the very first uh, case of local transmission started, then we really started getting a whole bunch of uh, samples in, in in the lab. Initially, um, they were just placing traps around um, infected individuals that had traveled and acquired Zika elsewhere and brought it back home, and so they were kind of looking around those individuals' homes to make sure that they weren't getting bitten by local mosquitoes and and starting the transmission cycle. Um, but then once um, there was a more, you know, the, the local transmission started, then it it, it, it really took off as far as the, the screening. Um, the state of Florida has, um, the Florida Department of Agriculture has now um, sort of funded a lab that's part of their group uh, to get the bulk of the screening. And so they basically have been doing um, the bulk of the screening for Zika. Um, but we've been involved um, whenever there is a mosquito pool that is positive, um, we get the um, RNA or, or the uh, homogenate in our lab, and 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 um, we've been working on sequencing the genomes of, of those pools, and, and we can talk a little bit more about that. But we've also, in addition to looking at sequences of uh, Zika and the local mosquitoes, we're comparing that to sequences of individuals that have acquired um, Zika locally, as well as individuals that have traveled and acquired Zika. And so we're looking at uh, the genomics um, of of trying to figure out, you know, is this one outbreak is where potentially is the origin of Zika that's coming into Florida and, and what can we learn about how this right. outbreak as it starts? Mm -hmm. 
Joe, you said pools of mosquitoes. Typically, how many? These are adult mosquitoes, right? Uh, these are all females, um, primarily Aedes aegypti. We've had just a few Aedes albopictus. The aegypti are the more um, common ones. We've gotten, see, I got some numbers. Um, all the positive pools are from Aedes aegypti. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of them are for, from Aedes aegypti. Um, we've had, um, since June, um, in Miami-Dade only, a little under 20,000 mosquitoes have been tested, which is about 1,300 or so pools of mosquitoes with seven positives. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're looking at. And that goes all the way up to October 4th, so last week. So your essay is PCR, right? PCR, so yes. Um, yep. So 20, 20, 20 odd mosquitoes in a pool? Um, it depends. Sometimes mosquito pools are only one mosquito. Um, typically, we try and they don't collect with more than 50 in a pool, even though sometimes they've kind of jammed them in there. Um, but even one mosquito is enough. If that mosquito is infected with Zika, we'll actually click up um, Zika positive. Actually, in fact, one of the last pools that was, um, I believe it was number pool number seven, came out Zika positive recently, and that only had one mosquito in, in that tube. So I, uh, the strategy here is uh, interesting because on the one hand, if you pool the mosquitoes, you don't have to do an insane amount of work. On the other hand, if uh, you have a positive pool, you don't know whether that was one or more mosquitoes. Right. You, you, you just know that at least one was positive in that trap, in that right. pool. Yeah. So these, uh, the samples you're getting, are they mainly Miami-Dade or only Miami-Dade? Is that right? So we've we've done um, a little bit for other counties, but primarily Miami Dade for this particular year. Um, yeah, yeah. There haven't been any positive mosquitoes from any other counties. Mm -hmm. And and the first positive came up from what area and roughly that, when? They all all the positive mosquitoes have come up from the Miami Beach area. Miami so Beach. even though there were a lot of traps set in the Windwood neighborhood, no uh. positive mosquito pools were detected there. Only when um, they started collecting in the Miami Beach area, where the positives did the positives start to come up. Hmm. Hmm. What do you think? So about did, did, <laughs> sorry, do questions. I remember you saying? Did you get twenty seven positives out of twenty thousand mosquitoes? Uh, no, seven seven positive pools, just seven. Yeah. Right. Okay. Out of, out of a out thousand of maybe, pools. Yeah. Yeah. Seven pools out of uh, about a thousand three hundred total pools in Miami. Right. Representing, representing, representing 20, 000 almost twenty thousand mosquitoes. Yeah, almost is a, a little over nineteen thousand, nineteen thousand two hundred, just about. So, how far apart are these traps placed? And for some of them, do you have a longitudinal uh, information? The same trap a couple weeks later or something like that? So we have, so the traps were set. Um, so it's kind of interesting because a lot of people sort of assume that surveillance happens very logically. <laughs> and <laughs> and especially in the case of an outbreak, as, as we've learned, that's really not the case. Because, um, um, yeah, so it's not like all the traps were set and then we just, you know, they kept monitoring the same traps and then figuring out where is the, where is the Zika virus being spread or whatnot. As I mentioned before, the traps were initially set close to individuals that had traveled and came back sick and, and they were placed around their homes or places where they worked. And then when um, there was evidence that there was local transmission in the Wynwood neighborhood, then a whole bunch of traps were placed in the Wynwood neighborhood. And once local transmission looked like it was occurring in Miami Beach, a whole bunch of traps got placed in Miami Beach. Now, the traps that were in Wynwood eventually got removed and moved to other areas of Miami Beach. And so, it's it's once Wynwood was declared cleared, it doesn't look like there's any local transmission. Those traps were then put to use in other places. And so, yes, we do know the Latin law, the, the, the coordinates of all the traps and when they were, where they were, how many mosquitoes total were collected in each trap. Um, and 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 how many pools? Um, so you know all that information is 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 available. Mm -hmm. Have you ever tried with the positive pools to recover infectious virus? Uh, yes, actually, we 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 have um, we have some that we're trying to grow up right now. Mm -hmm. We'll see what happens. They're tricky. Why? Why is it the way they were treated by the? Um, well, they were um, collected in RNA later. Ah, and, right. <laughs> yeah. So if there is, um, and and we do know we've done some control studies um, with with dengue virus in the past to show you know when you 
when you conserve your sample in the solution, do you lose um, infectivity? And yes, you do a couple of logs. It doesn't go away completely. Mm. Now, something that we've noticed about the Zika positive mosquito pools is when they're positive, they're very positive. Like the CT values are really, really, you know, they're in the 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 twenties. I mean, we're talking I mean, they're, they're mm. yeah, they're they're quite quite positive. And so, you know, even if the infectivity goes down, we're kind of hoping that yeah, yeah. there might be a few particles in there that with time and with blind passaging, we might be able to pick something up. Did you also, you also said you were doing some sequencing. Are you doing deep sequencing on these samples? So we're going to, so we actually were collaborating with two groups. Um, mm-hmm. uh, we're, we're working with uh, Christian Anderson from Scripps mm-hmm. over in La Jolla and with um, Pardi Sabeti from the Broad Institute. And uh, as a team, we're looking at two different approaches, an Amplicon-based approach just to basically pull up pieces of it and put it all together, or doing the deep sequencing, just an unbiased approach and mm-hmm. compare both of them. So we're actually doing both. So, so far, you don't know, you don't have enough data to, to indicate where the virus came from. So, um, actually, Scott, do you want to jump in? We we do have data. Sure. We, we do. Um, so we've been not only collaborating with uh, Miami-Dade Mosquito Control on the mosquitoes, but also with uh, the Department of Health Lab, mostly in Tampa, run by Andy Cannons. And so we've uh, sequenced with our collaborators from um, a, a fair good number of uh, human samples, as well as these seven mosquito positives. So these are both and, local uh, and travelers for the humans. Mm-hmm. Right. So we've got local and travelers. And it turns out that all of the Florida sequences is clustered together into a single clade that's distinct from anything else that has been found um, anywhere else in the Americas. Mm-hmm. Um, they do cluster closely with some other sequences from the Dominican Republic and um, with one sequence from Guadalupe. And so we can we can tell some things about how the epidemic is progressing in, in um in Florida and, and maybe what its origins might have been uh, from these sequences already, if you want to hear about that. Sure, love to. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm going to mention another person, uh, um, Trevor Bedford from the University of Washington from the Hutch there, who's also been helping us. Um, and then I also want to mention um, from US AMRID, Gus Palacios has been also posting some sequences. So mm-hmm. all of those sequences, ours and and the ones from US AMRID and, and everything we've been we've been looking at. And um, even though all of the Florida sequences from everybody seem to cluster together as a clade, that clade is really diverse and it has a long branch length. Mm-hmm. And so if you if you think about that, that means that either um, it's been in Florida for quite a while and has taken some time to diversify in Florida, or we've actually had multiple introductions into Florida from a similar source. Mm-hmm. And it looks like right. the source is somewhere in the Caribbean, although uh, we're not quite sure if it's Dominican Republic because you know there's not a lot of surveillance that's gone on in the Caribbean, so we may have missed something. Yeah. Um, but these two hypotheses are, are looking like um, – the, the either one long one one introduction probably in 2015 sometime and then slow diversification of the virus in Florida or what we think might be more likely but we're still kind of working on this analysis is if you look at the whole clade in Florida that whole cluster um, they group together into three lineages and those three lineages look like they might have been separately introduced into Florida sometime this year sometime in the spring of 2016 which would match with you know a, a large number of traveler uh, related cases um, so we're we're working on some analysis to see whether there were three introductions introductions are one and this has some some implications for the response if there's a single introduction that means that we missed it clinically for a long period of time yeah, but it right, probably yeah. means that introductions are going to be rare and if we can eradicate it in that one location where you know it seems to be taking off then we're probably good if there's multiple introductions then it means that probably our clinical detection was good and we picked it up right away clinicians picked it up right away but it may be that um, it's it's actually circulating in more locations than we think, and we may not be able to squash it that easily. Which, pr- which do you, you prefer? Have, which do you prefer? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, last week, if you would have asked me, I would have said eh, the single introduction. This week, um, I'm leaning towards the multiple introductions, yeah. but we are 
going to get a little more data in the next week or so, yeah. and I'm going to hold off making a hard uh, a hard prediction. I just think since it's been, as you say, clinically silent, assuming it came in 2015, for it to be silent is a, is a bit weird. Uh, there's probably not a monkey vector in which it's been amplified right. in the meantime, so it's probably just people. That's right. Sorry, we, yeah. we are the, we are the monkey, um, <laughs> right? Right now, but, um, yeah, you're presumably you're looking at different Caribbean isolates and seeing if they're clo- more closely related mm-hmm. to these three Florida cl- clades, and maybe I mean, obviously this is not going to be a popular uh, uh, opinion to disclose when you get those data, uh, but <laughs> you may you may point out specific places that it came from. Well, um, it's it's a shared problem, so. Um, you know, oh, if, oh, I if there's, I yeah, if there's an epidemiological problem, link, you, yeah. you can't use that as an excuse to place blame on anybody. Um, exactly. And and what we think is probably but, but in the in the news cycle and in the political world, these are not often seen as rational uh, <laughs> yeah. discussions. But they're, they're probably. I was just going to say that. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> okay, there's there's probably a rather complicated pattern of transmission uh, in the Caribbean with the yes. amount of tourism that goes on there. And yes. that's going to take a little while to sort out. Yeah. One of the things that I was going to point out is the one of the limits of the study is the fact that there's the sampling size, right? So Zika hasn't been sequenced in a lot of the Caribbean islands. There's really nothing from Cuba or Jamaica. or So there's a lot of islands out there for which there is no Zika sequence data. And so in order to really pinpoint the origin, we need to mine, um, basically get samples from other places to be able to see, well, how is it? Is, is it a one introduction or is it most closely related to, you know, island or country, nation, X, Y, or Z? Right. Right. And of course, there's an immense amount of traffic of people between Caribbean islands and South Florida. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of tourism. Um, a lot of cruise ships leave um, the port of Miami every day and, and go a lot to of many families, of these islands. For that matter. Yeah. We are essentially a Caribbean island. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you know, do you know, in a place where there's a, a pretty big outbreak, like in Brazil, what the frequency of discovery of Zika in mosquitoes is? No. Yeah. It was just published, actually. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's it's low. It's it's hard to find arboviruses and virus in uh, in mosquito pools. Yeah, so I just saw this paper, uh, Scott. I don't know if you've seen it, but let me give you the reference. It just came out. Um, sure. Here it is. Hold on. Yes, Twiv, my my uh, lab person said you have to tell them about this paper today. <laughs> just published in uh, a Brazilian journal. Um, uh, Mem Institute Oswaldo Cruz. Oswaldo Cruz, yeah. It's the title: First Detection of Natural Infection of Aedes aegypti with Zika Virus in Brazil and Throughout South America. So it's the first time they've actually found a Zika virus genomes in mosquitoes. There are 1,683 mosquitoes collected in Rio de Janeiro from June 2015 to May 2016, and th- mm-hmm. three pools were found to be positive. Okay. And yeah. uh, none of the examined Albopictus or Culex quinquefasciatus were positive. First nat- report of a natural infection in Brazil. So yeah, it's not easy. Cool. Yeah, so it's it's not easy to do. Yeah. Well, it's not easy to pick up, right? Because there are lots of mosquitoes out there, and <laughs> you can't check. I, I'm just kind of wondering. Uh, I'm just kind of wondering what the what the load in mosquitoes is with an arbovirus when you're having a really active outbreak and how to use that number to think about what's going on, for example, in Florida. Right. Uh, in, in general, um, a rule of thumb, if, if you're approaching anywhere near 1% of your sampling in the mosquito population as positive, that's a huge uh, transmission rate. Yeah, sounds like it. Yeah. All right. Anything else before we move on? We actually have some emails that are relevant to some of these issues that we're hoping. Yeah, there's a lot of good questions in those we're emails. We're hoping we're that Sharon and Scott can help us with. But before we do that, I'll tell you about the sponsor of this episode, Curiosity Stream, the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service. They say have over 1,500 titles and 600 hours of content founded by John Hendricks of Discovery Channel. So what you're going to get is the real deal, not fiction, but nonfiction and they uh, have lots of things of interest to our listeners. You can watch these 
uh, programs on the web. You can watch them on your device, whether it be a phone or one of these little boxes you hook up to your TV, like Apple TV or Chromecast. You can get in 196 countries. And what they have is a lot of science, technology, nature, history, interviews, lectures. So I was checking out the front page of Curiosity Stream today. They have um, a program called Stephen Hawking's Favorite Places. Where in the whole universe would he like to be? Another, <laughs> another program called Rise of the Continents. How did the jigsaw puzzle of Pangea come together? The butterfly effects. Big movements of change have often started with tiny events or personal decisions that end up affecting the history of their world, of our world. They have a program on Hubble's imager, uh, insects, big world on a, in a small garden. A photographer rigs special cameras to capture the world of London in his backyard. Uh, lots of, lots of, lots of cool stuff. So, uh, um, you should check it out and, uh, you can also see lots and lots of super high definition material, 4K libraries. They have over 50 hours of content. They have monthly and annual plans available starting at two ninety nine a month, less than a cup of coffee. So check out curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the promo code microbe during sign up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. That's two entire months free of one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of TWIV. Now, I have one email that I thought I would read. because It has nothing to do with Zika, but it's a call for help. It's from Tolga who writes, Is there any lab in New York with a two or three photon microscope that is willing to do a third-party research consulting project i would appreciate your help so just give us an email at twiv at microbe.tv if you can help them out Two now on the classified ad section of twiv <laughs> <laughs> two or three photons yes. i know there's one here in the axle lab but i don't think he listens to twiv to anybody or anybody oh, to, to, to twiv sorry <laughs> all right um now here we have one about the singapore zika outbreak why don't you, why don't you take that alan and our guests can uh can answer it. <laughs> sure. Uh, Felix writes, Dear Twiv hosts, uh, news regarding the recent Zika outbreak in Singapore triggered my curiosity, and I'd like to ask your opinions on this matter. News report from a press conference earlier today mentioned that based on the sequencing analysis, quote, the virus belongs to the Asian lineage and likely evolved from the strain that was already circulating in Southeast Asia. The newspaper article also mentioned that the virus wasn't imported from South America. My questions are as follows. One, does the virus that causes the outbreaks in the Americas uh, differ significantly enough to enable us to differentiate clearly between the American and Asian lineage? I've read before that the Zika outbreak in the Americas is caused by the Asian lineage, and I'm confused with the statement. Perhaps it's just a matter of wording, and I'm looking forward to details from the research team. Second, if the Zika outbreak in Singapore comes from an older Asian lineage, why the sudden spike? Can it be that there have been multiple Zika infections in the island which remained undetected, or perhaps those cases were misdiagnosed as dengue? Are you aware of, aware of any recent studies that try to figure out how prevalent the circulation of Zika is in Asia and Africa before the recent outbreaks? Dengue is a common scourge in Southeast Asia, and I wouldn't be surprised if many previous Zika infections were misdiagnosed as dengue. I apologize if these issues have been discussed in previous episodes. I've enjoyed listening to your TWIV and other podcasts in the series during my daily commute in the last two years. The podcasts in the series have reinvigorated my interest in the infectious diseases field. I wish I'd started listening while I was in college a few years ago. Oddly enough, I took Vincent's virology course in Coursera three years ago without listening to any of these podcasts. Thank you for your excellent contribution to these science outreach avenues. Keep up the good work. And uh, Andrew, wait, so that was Felix writes at the beginning, and yeah. then it's signed Andrew in Jakarta. I probably made a P mistake. Yeah. Okay. Uh, P.S. Um, a Google search indicates it's currently 27 degrees Celsius with 79% humidity. Uh, and gives a link to this news article. So, Sharon or Scott, any thoughts on these issues? You have the questions in front of you, right? Yes, I'm looking sure, at the first yeah. question. So, the, it's whether there's... Genetically, there are any 
significant differences between American lineages and Asian lineages, and can can you tell them apart? I, I think is what I'm reading into it, and and the answer right. is yes, based on the work that we've been done and the sequences that are available on GenBank. Um, there are diff- genetic differences between them, and you can actually distinguish, you know, how, right. the relatedness of the different um, genomes. So it's it's a doable thing. Well, just like you two are looking at differences, sequence differences between Miami strains and Caribbean island strains. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And so the differences are going to be even more so between what's going on in the Caribbean and Florida right. and coming from And what's say, going Singapore. on in Singapore. Unless somebody got on a plane in Miami and took it to Singapore, but that's not apparently what happened. Right, right. He wants to know why the sudden spike Instead. Why the sudden right. spike? Um, Whether misdiagnosis as dengue, that's certainly a possibility there, for yeah. sure. I, I don't think that's so much of a possibility there. Uh, Singapore is really experienced um, with dengue and other viruses there, um, especially their their CDC, which is at the Tang Tak Seng Hospital. They have a, a number of really good clinicians and scientists there and at uh, some of the universities. Um I'm not sure. I, I think it would be a stretch to have uh, to assume that they're going to misdiagnose these things. Um, I think that there might be something else going on. I'm not sure entirely what it is, but uh, they certainly know what they're doing with uh, with dengue there, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're on the ball with with their Zika um, their their Zika work as well. So, is there any uh, archived serum? That's been looked at where we could say Zika's been here or has not been here until recently? Sure. As a matter of fact, um, we've done some work with the Tang Tok Seng Hospital on, on dengue. Um, mm. And some of the, the samples that we've had that have come from Asia um, showed actually um, a history. They show antibodies that are highly neutralizing against Zika. So uh, we actually have, you know, data from our laboratory that shows that Zika has been circulating for a while in Southeast Asia. Okay, great. Yeah. All right, the next one's from Robert, who says, I'm reading this book by Donald G. McNeil Jr., Norton 2016. The author is a reporter with the New York Times and very knowledgeable, judging by what I see in the book compared to the discussion of Zika on TWIV. And on page 80... It means that in a good way. Good way, yes. Yes. On page 86, the author cites a conversation with Dr. Ian Lipkin, who makes a chilling prediction about the future development of apparently healthy babies of mothers with Zika. Quote, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw big upswings in ADHD, autism, epilepsy, and schizophrenia. And, and quote, yikes, always enjoy your show, Bob. So I have a copy of uh, Zika, um, which I got from Norton with the hope that I would uh, interview Mr. McNeil. But he has, um, for several months now, he has evaded. Uh, we set up appointments, and then he cancels, or, or his publicist cancels. So I thought I could then, uh, I don't think he's going to do it, basically. I don't think he wants to come up here and um, and so forth. But um, I wanted to point out, there are parts of this book that are interesting when he talks about the political and social back stories of Zika, and that's his strength as a reporter, of course. But when he gets into the science, it gets a little weak. Let me give you uh, for an example. On page 23, he's describing how flaviviruses infect cells. He writes, quote, they resemble sinister Christmas ornaments. Inside each hollow ornament is the payload, a strand of RNA about 10,000 nucleotides long that it injects into the cell it invades, end quote. Of course, if it's, mm. it's got RNA, it's not hollow, right? Right, And on the same page, the quote, RNA turns itself into DNA and hijacks the internal machinery every cell uses to copy its own DNA and make new cells. Eventually, the cell explodes and the viruses are released to attack other cells spreading the illness, end quote. Transubstantiation. So many people (laughs) like to make all RNA viruses into retroviruses, but only retroviruses copy their DNA, RNA into DNA. <laughs> same, I found the same mistake in a, in a flu book uh, many years ago. Uh, Sharon, do you want to read one? Is that okay? I thought the next one you would be Sure. It's Phil. Okay. Let's see. So yeah. Phil writes, hello, Team TWIV. I was hoping to get the TWIV insight or general thoughts on the attached picture. For those that can't see the picture, this is an off insect repellent stand in a King's Super's grocery store with the advertisement 
protect against the mosquitoes that carry the Zika virus. I thought this was interesting advertising, not in the least because this is in Denver, Colorado, and 80s do not live, at least according to the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, and he gives a, a link. I wonder if someone will see this and assume mosquitoes in Colorado can infect them with Zika. Any thoughts on advertising like this? My friends are divided. Some think this is fine since off would indeed protect against 80s. Others think this is a profiting off fear mongering since we don't have the relevant mosquito here. As for the weather, it is currently 60 degrees Fahrenheit around 63 Celsius with 65% humidity, 16 Celsius and 65% humidity and light wind in Denver. Thank you all for TWIB. I started listening to TWIB in January and now it is a weekly ritual. It is a great way to keep informed uh, before starting graduate school in a few months. Cheers, Phil. Huh, he, interesting. And um, Well, I find this absolutely repellent. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> Look at that nice picture. It's a bright orange sign with white letters, protect against the Z the mosquitoes that may carry the Zika virus, you know, the, the orange off color. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I wonder, is this just in Colorado or is this the same marketing that they use in I'm other sure states? It's, I'm sure it's nationwide. Uh, <laughs> this is the kind of thing when you've got a national brand, <clears throat> they're going to print up these. This is a... <clears throat> It's like one of these fold-out cardboard displays that they, the stores will set at the, the end of every aisle or whatever. Um, and, uh, yeah, they're going to print off a gazillion of these. They're going to send them out to all their distributors. And, yes, they are hyping the product based on the latest scary disease news. Um, it's not inaccurate, as, as Phil points out. These, this will help repel Edie's Egypti, the fact that you don't have Edie's Egypti locally <laughs> where this off is being sold is not really mentioned. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I go to the grocery store here in Massachusetts and I buy sunscreen and maybe insect repellent before I'm going to go someplace in the tropics. Right. In which case, the sunscreen and insect repellent I pack could be repelling Edie's Egypti. So um, I don't think it's wrong. I, it's, but a lot of people are going to buy it thinking, oh, Zika, yeah, I got to protect myself without even knowing that the mosquito is not there. And it, you know, those people are going to be protected against West Nile. Um, all right. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I, I have a hard time getting too worked up about something like this. I, I would I would also take a picture of it and maybe tweet it and say, uh, yeah. I didn't realize <laughs> this was in New England. Um, but well, My uh, question so, is, is, is five ninety nine a good price? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Apparently, you can save up to eighty cents on it in this uh, <laughs> supermarket. Five ninety nine for six ounces. I have no idea. Is it six ounces? Let the yeah. buyer beware. Yep. Yeah, Kathy, can you take the next one, please? Paul. Yes. Paul. That's from Paul. To the twivel seat. I don't know I don't, what the, I don't get that. Is like that a like twi <laughs> like a swivel seat? Swivel, I guess. Yeah. For a, Rumble seat? I don't know. Anyway, okay. A climate-controlled 22C and zero humidity at 25,000 feet above the Ohio Valley, reading about the WHO recommendation to delay pregnancy. And Paul gives the link to that. I guess he's in an airplane, right? I think Sounds so. like it to me. I hope so. <laughs> oh, wow, yeah. Otherwise, it's pretty hard to get 25,000 feet above the Ohio Valley. The Ohio Valley. On the ground. <laughs> yeah. The question <laughs> that comes to my mind is this. How far is Zika virus itself from being its own vaccine for populations at significant risk? Isn't it the case that 80% of infections are entirely asymptomatic? The vast majority of symptomatic infections have no serious complications in healthy people that are not pregnant. The remaining risk from deliberate infection for non-pregnant individuals in affected areas is negligible anyway, since everyone expects that virtually everyone in those areas will be exposed to the virus in the coming years anyway. And that post-infection immunity seems to protect against birth defects associated with subsequent infections. So, for a family that wants to have children, wouldn't deliberate infection coupled with a brief delay in pregnancy until the virus clears be a coherent strategy in the absence of a vaccine? How much better than the virus itself would a vaccine have to perform to be approved for use in people at significant risk from an accidental infection demonstrated not to be pregnant and on reliable birth control? While a vaccine for universal use would require a lot more science, the risks associated with deliberate infection do not seem large compared to the risks reality incurred by people seeking to have children. 
It's not nearly as good a vaccine as varile or polio. Hmm. Mm. I don't know. I just think the, the the possible complications are not worth risking. No. What, what do you What do you think, Michael? Uh, Scott, sorry. No, that's all right. And and that brings us right back to the first uh, the first letter that you read. Um, where there might be more subtle complications later on. Yes. Um, yeah, we really don't know. I'm. And, and this is not a new idea. I mean, uh, there there have been you know you've heard of. Uh, um, Shoot, I'm forgetting the name Me- of the measles. virus. Measles. Well, um, um, measles. chicken pox. Parties. Chicken pox. Chicken pox. Parties. You, you get all your parties. kids infected yeah. with chicken pox, and yeah. then you know, then they're protected. So that's the same sort of, of an idea. That's like the the South Park cartoon where they uh, sent the kids <laughs> over to their neighbor's house, so they all get the chicken pox. Yep. Right. 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 Well, they, yeah, and and uh, polio. You know, one percent get a get a serious problem and. For violation, if you if you snort somebody's um, smallpox scar, yep. you you know you've got a ninety nine percent chance of not dying. Yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, so eighty percent are asymptomatic. Do you want to be? How lucky do you feel, punk? Yeah. <laughs> the, the other issue here, he he says, you know, wait a bit and then get pregnant. We don't know how long. You know, how long's the, a bit? The virus yeah, seems to persist yeah. in in semen, and we don't know how long that is. So that's just not good. You'd have to wait. Pro- I would. Wait over a year, probably, just to be safe, right. and then, then do PCR to be sure. And on the other hand, I just had this conversation with a former student who's living in the Caribbean and wants to have more kids and was, was really seriously considering this. I just don't think it's a good idea for, for all these reasons. You know, you may wait a month and then you still infect your partner because you've, you've got a, yeah. a virus there. Yeah. Or you may develop Guillain-Barre, which isn't great. Yeah. Or, or could even get into your CNS. Now, that's pretty rare, but I wouldn't want to risk it. No. So I don't think it's a good so idea. So the bottom line is a vaccine is a better idea. Yeah, a vaccine or avoid the virus entirely if you can um, and and take extra precautions. And, you know, any any excuse to promote birth control more widely is probably a good thing anyway. Um, but, yeah, you know, obviously people want to have kids and then they can but they just need to be aware that you if you're in one of the areas affected by this virus you need to be extra careful about not getting it um I mean, the, when you're the, the problem is you know 80 percent asymptomatic so yeah you, you let's i would say to the point where if you're in a at-risk endemic area and you uh, want to have a family you should probably get checked to make sure, yeah. and that's and and labs are not going to just do that for you. That's the problem. Also, you know, there's no yes. approved Zika diagnostic yet anywhere. And even if there is, there's a huge access to care problem. Yeah. Um, Rich, can you take uh, the next one there from Steve? Sure. Steve writes and sends a link uh, and elaborates on it. Hi, Vincent. Sorry to read of your disappointment on Obama putting off decisions on fungi, uh, funding Zika. This call from the UK's MRC came out today for setting up networks to find new ways to deal with the rise in vector-borne diseases. Although the lead for each network looks to have uh, looks to have been in the UK, it seems to me that international research collaborations already seem to be the norm. So perhaps you and your various colleagues in the Twix disciplines might be able to work up networks to benefit from this new funding stream. Apologies if I've got the whole process mixed up as I have no experience in any kind of funding, but as uh, much of what you call out mentions is regularly covered on your podcast, I thought I'd pass it on. All the best. Steve, who is in uh, Lutton or Luton, England. Uh, So this is a, a link from, as he said, the MRC, trying to establish uh, research networks that are global in nature uh, to uh, collaborate in investigating uh, arbovirus diseases. And I assume this is not affected by Brexit? (laughs) (laughs) Who knows? I mean, I applaud the idea of the UK reaching out globally. It just hasn't been the recent trend. Yeah, good point. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, Useful. All right, yeah. uh, Scott, can you take uh, Marion's? Sure. Uh, Marion writes, I've heard y'all, 
and she definitely puts a y'all in there, discuss antibody-dependent enhancement of infection, ADE, of dengue several times as a mysterious phenomenon. According to a talk I just heard, one hypothesis to explain ADE may be that it's related to the high proportion of immature dengue particles in infections. So this hypothesis was not at the point of the talk I heard. It was mentioned in passing. The hypothesis is that anti-PRM, which is uh, a small protein protein, prior to E, but found on the virus surface, that she didn't say that, not anti-E antibodies are responsible for ADE. Like many enveloped viruses, dengue undergoes a final maturation cleavage of the E envelope protein by host furin proteases in the trans-Golgi network. In dengue, this is an inefficient cleavage. The immature protein found on immature virus particles is called PRM. Therefore, infectious virus is actually a heterogeneous mix of mature and immature particles. The resulting immune response is also heterogeneous against both E and PRM. Apparently, some anti-PRM antibodies may enhance infection, perhaps by maturing the immature particles or facilitating uptake. Apparently, they would be cross-serotype reactive. Therefore, residual anti-PRM antibodies from one infection linger and, rather than protecting, enhance subsequent infections. Additionally, each serotype differs in its extent of immaturity. Dengue 4 has more efficient cleavage than Dengue 2, so Dengue 2 is the most heterogeneous. I have appended one reference I found on the subject. Uh, yeah, from BMC Microbiology. The speaker mentioned that the dengue patients with disease have more anti-PRM antibodies. Hmm. This also explains why a dengue vaccine is possible despite ADE as long as the vaccine presents only E and not PRM as the antigen. The new work on the cryo-EM structure of Zika shows homogeneity, a lack of partial Im Im immaturity. Therefore, the phenomenon of heterogeneous maturation, at least as a major feature, appears thus far to be unique to dengue. This suggests that Zika would not be expected to display ADE and that ADE would not prevent a Zika vaccine. One caveat I would add is that the virus that was used for the EM study was produced from furin overexpressing cells. So the natural situation may differ from this. Hmm. Now, your, your, uh, Mike, uh, Scott, your, your study was done using antibodies, monoclonal antibodies that react with E, correct? With E, right. So I can, I can shed a little light on this, actually. In some previous studies, I think these were out of Gavin Screton's lab at uh, Imperial College in London, um, or were they Lancevecchia? Oh, they might have been Lancevecchias. Anyway, the PRM protein is useless as an antigen. Um, all of the antibodies that anyone's ever been able to find against PRM have no neutralizing activity at all. So yeah, PRM is like a giant enhancing antigen. Um, and all of the uh, neutralizing antibodies do come against, uh, are directed against the E protein. Um, so, but but it's not as simple as that because there are still lots and lots of enhancing antibodies against E that have no neutralizing activity. So even if you just make a, a vaccine out of E and leave the PRM out, that might help shift the balance, but you're still going to have a lot of, uh, of only enhancing non-neutralizing antibodies just against the E protein itself. And that's probably going to be the case both for dengue and Zika. So, uh, do I hear correctly then that this is not an unreasonable idea, but uh, it's one of these things where it, it, it could be a contributing factor, but the uh, standard rap about antibody-dependent enhancement is also true? That's my understanding. I, I, I think that making antibodies against PRM um, is probably a bad, bad thing either uh -huh. for dengue okay. or for Zika. And, and right. the only good antibodies are the ones that are going to be against E and are neutralizing. But right. E gives you lots of non-neutralizing antibodies too. And you get an enhancement from that, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Now, the, the Dengvaxia has both E and PRM, right? So Sure does. It's... And so do all of the proposed Zika vaccines, including the one that the NIH just threw $43 million at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Is that the DNA-based vaccine? Yeah, that's the DNA-based one that Sanofi is making that also makes the Denvaxia that also has been shown to enhance. So right. I don't see these vaccines going anywhere. Wow. Isn't the Sanofi so the only- a recombinant or, or inactivated? I don't know if that's the DNA oh, vaccine. I think that's you a know, different You're right. You're right. That's a different one. The Sanofi one um, is, a, is an inactivated you're inactivated right. Zika, so it is going to have the full PRMNE. Mm. Yeah. All right. So the only way around this would be some sort of subunit vaccine that uh, presented only mature E. Yeah. That would and still have, but that would still have the still. <clears throat> antigens yeah. to, that are not neutral, that don't have neutralizing epitopes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well. okay. All right. You, e. One possibility is to present individual epitopes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. All right. I just wanted to go back. Uh, my microphone went kaflui just as we were finishing oh. up Steve from Luton's letter. Okay. Um, I think uh, that, Vincent, you didn't have disappointment on Obama putting off decisions. I thought it was more the Congress's inability Congress. to pass yes. something. Yes. Because uh, Obama called for something February 8th, 2016. He was yeah. on the leading yes. edge. Yeah. And yeah. he asked for $1.9 billion and, and, and recently uh, Congress approved $1.1 billion. Right. All right, one more. But the, but the trend is he can be blamed for anything. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> one more uh, Zika email, and then we'll move on to picks. Uh, this is actually from a marketing specialist at Newsy, so I'll keep it quick. This is this is something I received before the Olympics started, but uh, they have a three part series on Zika entitled "Zika's Untold War," and um, there are videos over on YouTube. And you can check them out. It's a, a story about Zika in El Salvador. And cool. uh, Christina at Newsy knows where to turn to publicize virus-related stuff. Yes. I'm sorry. There's one more. Um, uh, and uh, perhaps, uh, Alan, you could read. Sure. I'll take Dennis. Dennis. A uh, question about Zika virus host range evolution enabling possible avian reservoirs. I'm trying to understand why birds that are being challenged over and over again with Zika virus via mosquito bites, just like people, do not support the evolution or selection of virus and thus become viremic enough to allow for avian reservoirs of the virus to be created. The birds could be completely asymptomatic. Uh, Flavivirus can mutate with high frequency, especially at certain highly variable genomic locations. Changes at these sites via low fidelity replication could alter their coat protein sequence in minor ways. This would include changes that disrupt the binding or enhance to enhance the binding to various important cellular viral receptors. Such changes in the avidity for various mammalian avian cellular receptors uh, would be selected if virus replication rates were enhanced in that host. If that were to happen, it would give them the ability to adapt to various hosts and increase their host range. There are four strains of dengue that likely evolved via such a mutation mechanism. Did these strains receive host range changes as well? How much do we know about the avidity of the Zika, dengue, and West Nile virus for important virus receptors, be they avian or primate? Do we have it data about any evolutionary changes among the current Zika virus and thus its current host range? Um, and I would just say, while this is this is certainly a plausible explanation of how viruses could uh, expand their host range or could conceivably infect both birds and mammals the way West Nile does. Um, to my knowledge, nothing along those lines has been observed with, uh, with Zika. And it's actually kind of a tall hurdle, um, depending on the receptor that the virus uses. Birds and mammals are very, very evolutionarily distant. So the available receptors are kind of slim pickings if you want to be able to infect both. And remember that evolution is not teleological. Zika virus can't understand the advantages that it would get by being able to infect birds. Um, it would be it would certainly be a sound investment strategy for Zika virus to work on that project, but uh, it doesn't work that way. And as far as we know, it does not have any ability to, to infect any bird species that have, I know have, of. Has anyone looked in birds? I was wondering about that. If anyone has done any studies with that? Yeah, I don't. I don't know of any. Yeah, I, I, you can. I'm assuming somebody's at least done surveys of of uh, some species of maybe not birds, but 
Anybody in know? the flavivirus family, the uh, the bird infecting viruses, St. Louis encephalitis, Japanese encephalitis, um, West Nile, they cluster together, and the primate infecting viruses, dengue, yellow fever, um, Zika, they cluster together. Um, so it, it does. It seems like it's a, it's not impossible, but it's probably a pretty large hurdle to get between those hosts. Right, and it may be that the the primate only flaviviruses have, have boxed themselves into an evolutionary point on the map where they can't quite, you know, get through the hump to get over to where they would need to be in order to, to also infect birds. I'm not sure. I guess it would be dependent on receptor choice. So here's a paper in PLOS NTD, and they're summarizing data which say there have been serology done on forest-dwelling birds in Uganda, and they certainly have antibodies that react with Zika virus, but mm. you know they <laughs> these, right. these viruses cross react, yeah. and so I think that's a very tough result to interpret. And it's yeah. uh, from 1971 before we understood all this cross reactivity. So I'd say we don't know. Instead of testing by PubMed, I googled and I found <laughs> an article um, that oh rats. Um, it replicates it's in rats. rats. It's in rats. <laughs> oh no! Some pop up just came up and covered the whole thing. Yeah, don't you love that? Uh. So, uh, that, uh, a study done in Indonesia in the 1970s showed that some animals, particularly horses, cows, ducks, bats, goats, and water buffaloes, could become infected with Zika, but they found absolutely no evidence that they could transmit the disease to human beings. Nor was there any evidence that these animals became sick. But this is a popular press article, so of course there's no link to the real yeah. paper. I'll bet it's an antibody yeah. study also. Yeah. And there's lots of evidence, like with West Nile. I mean, humans are a dead-end host, so you can probably get infection in a lot of different animals. Yeah. But whether or not you get enough to transmit and really make it part of the cycle, yep. um, yeah, that's, that's a, a different story. Good point. All right. This episode is also sponsored by Drobo. Drobo are storage devices that directly connect to your Mac or Windows machine or Linux box using Thunderbolt or USB 3. They come in a variety of sizes from 5 to 8 to 12 drive bays. And you can use them to store your data. Now, they're not like other RAID products. They are different. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about how Drobo differs from Garden Variety RAID. They're unique because they are designed to, pr to protect your important data forever. No other storage array has such a high goal. For example, the founder of Drobo lost his honeymoon pictures. He was storing them on a RAID 1 system, and it failed. Now, RAID 1 uses mirroring for data protection. And what he thought was what happened was the images got corrupted, and the corrupted versions were propagated against all the drive and therefore he could never recover them. So he was horrified at that, of course, and uh, he searched for an alternative but couldn't find any, so he came up with Drobo. So Drobo is beyond RAID. It's based on the idea of RAID, but it's not exactly RAID or any of the flavors. Of it's RAID. beyond RAID, and it's even better than off. <laughs> it's beyond RAID and better than off. What a great <laughs> quip. Wow. You're actually listening. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> so Drobo protects your data against a single drive failure. From the first model that was developed, Drobo has a battery-backed cache in it to store data from your computer. If, for example, the power goes out, it has this battery that will store the data that you've just written before the, the uh, drive shuts down. And then later on in the development of Drobo, they added dual drive redundancy, so you can be protected against two drive failures. So that means um, if two drives fail, you can just pull them out Put in new ones, and all the data will be reproduced on them, so the data are protected. And then later on, they added what's called background data scrubbing. That protects you against bit flips and other random corruptions. You know, if a little single bit just randomly flips on the drive, just screw up your picture, and that'll be propagated on other systems, but uh, uh, Drobo's figured out a way to protect against that as well. Uh, these Drobo's can be expanded. You know, if you have a five-drive array and you have five two terabyte drives in them you fill them up you can just pull one out and put a bigger drive in you can mix the different sizes of 
of drives, which is not something you can do in traditional RAID. They're very simple to set up. And there are lights on the front that tell you the status. If they're green, that means you have plenty of room. If they're orange, it means one of the drives is uh, getting full, and where the light is tells you which drive it is. And when it turns red, it means it's full. You need to put a new drive in. If it's flashing red, the drive has failed, and you have to replace it. Really cool, really simple system designed to be simple to use and to protect your data, uh, dare I say, long after you're gone. Microbe TV listeners can save $100 off their purchase of a Drobo 5D, 5DT, 5N, or any 8 or 12 drive system. Just go to drobostore.com and use the discount code microbe100, uh, and you'll get $100 off on your purchase. Very cool items. Highly recommended for home and laboratory use. All right, let's uh, end up this twiv with some picks of the week, and maybe we'll let uh, our guests go first. Sharon, uh, I warned you to have a pick, and you, you indeed, you have one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I actually found uh, two things. The first one is um, the uh, from the Florida website. Um, this is where you can grab the weekly Florida arbovirus surveillance information. And it includes, it's not just about Zika. It has other nice. endemic mosquito-borne viruses, including West Nile virus, uh, Eastern equine encephalitis virus, St. Louis encephalitis, and other things. It talks about malaria as well, chikungunya. And so it tells you on a week-by-week -week basis whether or not there's any activity for that particular virus, whether it's a human case or, or an animal um, talks about chicken traps and whether or not they're finding West Nile virus uh, serology in, in some animals. And, and, and specifically it addresses cases of um, Zika virus uh, local transmission versus travelers and also tells you what countries the individuals have visited um, from where they got um, Zika. So that, that was one of the picks. Well, let me just say, this is so cool because you can learn that there were 41 imported cases of malaria in Florida in 2016. Nobody knows that. It's amazing. Right. Mm -hmm. From all sorts of places all over the world. Wow. And, of course, they never go beyond, they never transmit within Florida, right? Right, right. Cool. That's great. So it's fun to look at and it has a lot of information. Yeah. And then the second one was just a, a fun website that I found by cartoonistgroup.com. And it's the Zika virus comics and cartoons from different editorials. And it just has a lot of... Um, very politically incorrect pictures that include uh, Zika as the punchline, has politics. Uh, it talks a lot about the Olympics and um, Congress and not passing bills for Zika. And so it's just kind of interesting to see um, all Zika related. That's great. When, when you first go to the page, there's lots of thumbnail pictures, but if you mouse over them, then the cartoons become large enough to read. Yes. This is I was great. in particular looking at the first one. It, <laughs> it, it's a uh, microcephaly. It, there's a little label on the side with a looks like a congressman with a sort of malformed sh uh, head. So it looks really wow. What is that? That doesn't look quite right. But then there's a mosquito that has Zika written on it, slurping off of it, and it's labeled Congress. So the it's someone from Congress. So um, mm. anyway, just um, it's great. I had a lot of these a guy guy carrying yeah. an Olympic torch and yeah. it's a bug zapper. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was really cute. I like that the, uh, one. There's a lot of Olympic related ones, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. great. It's cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Scott, what do you have for us? Well, I'm going to uh, pick this uh, website called Next Strain. It's developed by one of our collaborators, Trevor Bedford, who's at the Hutch. And what it is is it's an online real-time phylogenetic and molecular clock analysis tool for open access sequence data. There's an awful lot of open access sequence data that's uh, being put up out there. Um, there's a bunch of Ebola sequences out there. There's a bunch of new Zika sequences we're contributing to. And um, what Trevor has done is, is trying to make something that's going to pull all this together and make it easy for someone who doesn't have a tremendous amount of experience doing these sorts of analyses to pull together this open open access data and make a tree and be able to analyze a tree and see what's going on in the molecular epidemiological situations as it's happening. 
And this is this, really cool. It is yeah. very cool. <laughs> Fabulous. Fabulous. This is cool. So they won the first uh, phase winner of the Open Science Project, uh, Open Science Prize, one of the six finalists that's sponsored by the NIH and the Wellcome Trust and HHMI. So I think this is going to really get rounded out and developed a lot pretty quickly. And it's going to be really cool. I love this. You can mouse you know, so over. Is- you get the uh, isolate name. I guess some of your data are on here as well. Yeah, right? absolutely. It's so be don't that, that red cluster on the side. Mm-hmm. I see Florida. Yeah, okay. yeah, beautiful. A lot, a lot so of this site is not like automatically harvesting data. Uh, this has to be input, right? Yeah, uh, it, it, currently it is, but I think it has the ability to be able to do that eventually. Yeah, it could, it could, it could pull it out of uh, GenBank. Yeah, yeah. That's was beautiful. Really nicely done. Yeah, really nice. Very nicely that. done. Thank you that for that. That's great. Alan, what do you have? I have, uh, oh, let me stop sliding the slider on that. Um, <laughs> I have a, um, uh, a video that is on Vimeo. And um, this is, uh, it shows the evolution of bacterial uh, antibiotic resistance which of course you can do on any Petri dish. You put a few circles traditionally. But the way they did this graphically and in this video is really just visually beautiful. Um, so they made this mega plate. The thing's huge and it's rectangular and they put a little India ink in the auger. So it's got a black background and then they've got soft auger, a soft auger on the top and they have zones of antibiotics um, clearly delineated and they explain all this in the video. And then they put a lawn of, regular E. coli, lab E. coli culture on each end of the plate. And you can watch as the bacteria multiply and spread through the soft auger and they get to the zone where the antibiotic is and they pause. And then you see the mutants pop through into the first antibiotic zone and they they, uh, multiply and spread across it and then they get to the next higher concentration and there's another little pause and you see the mutants branch out again and then they overlay a phylogenetic tree over this thing. It's just really neat to watch. Yeah. Yeah, so so cool. they've, they've sequenced the isolates. That's where they get the tree from, right? Yes. Nice. Yeah. This is just amazing. It's beautiful. Very nice. Wow. Yeah, I, I love it. Thank you. Just a really nice visual Very demonstration cool. of something we, we always talk about and, and now you can see it yeah, happening. Yeah, that's great. Rich, what do you have? Uh, yet another we- uh, weather website uh, yeah. relevant to our current situation, given to me by yes. a friend. This is a forecasting, it's strictly a forecasting mm-hmm. site, really. It's called Windy TV, mm-hmm. and it's a really nice uh, graphic representation of what the wind is doing at any given time. It's got little streamers that uh, indicate wind direction and speed, and it's uh, you can overlay it with very various colors for various parameters, notably uh, wind, and it'll look all around and give you a local forecast, and et cetera. And it's got a little uh, time slider that shows you the forecast, so you can uh, watch the hurricane crawl yeah. up the coast and yes. see where you think it's going to go. There's something, uh, so, there's, something it, else, there's something else spinning out in the Atlantic as well. Yeah, there's another hurricane. There's another there. hurricane. Wonderful. Yeah. Yes. And it's got like uh, three different, uh, I looked into this, so I've got three different um, forecasting uh, tools that you can use all of them. Mm-hmm. The about thing is really pretty cool. If you click on that down in the lower right-hand corner and find out about this guy, this is a programmer who is a sort of, uh, he's obsessed with wind and is into <laughs> wind sports like, uh, you know. Oh, neat kite sailing and kite skiing and and everything else he's sort of an extreme sports guy so i thought this was well i've been at it all day but uh <laughs> interest of interest to others as well. neat very cool this is really cool kathy what do you have i picked a zika map and timeline you can never have too many maps or too many timelines <laughs> and this one uh starts out with the orange circle being today's date, October 6th, and then you can click on uh, previous earlier circles and it'll update the map and then you can uh, mouse over on the map uh, and or actually you have to click on them, I guess, to get where actual cases were. So it's just another visual way of, 
uh, tracking the 2016 Zika outbreak. It's cool. great. You can put the mosquitoes on top of it as well. Does anyone know if there is a global epi curve for the outbreak that in all countries mashed together for that year? I'd love to see that. Somebody must have. I know, I know individual countries. So the Pan American site I mentioned earlier has individual countries, but I would be curious to see it on a global basis. No, I don't know. I don't know. Well, oh, Vincent, I hadn't noticed that mosquito feature, so that's up in the top left. You yeah, just right. Click for different so it's types. A, it's interesting. You yeah. click for Egypti, and you know all the cases in the U.S. Most of them are, are where there's not much distribution because they're mostly imported cases. And then you go to Africa, where the central belt has you know a ton of Egypti, and there's no <laughs> cases because they have so much previous immunity. It's very cool. <laughs> I have two small picks. Uh, the first has to do with uh, the new Nobel Prize in Medicine for 2016, which was just uh, announced uh, in the last couple of weeks. Of course, uh, that goes to Yoshinori Osumi of Japan for his early work on autophagy uh, in yeast. And it's they have, if you go to the website, you can find brief summaries, the prize announcement, the press release, and there's something called Advanced Information which is, for us, like a review article. And it reviews uh, the, the state of the field. And it's a wonderful story of you know, how autophagy was first discovered in the late 50s, and nobody could make heads or tail of it for years. They thought it might be important. And then, uh, then uh, Osumi started working on it in yeast as an assistant professor at the University of Tokyo. He said... I want to find mutants that are defective in it. And he, just, he, he, def, he defined a, a phenotype, and he identified 15 genes, which we now know as the ATG genes, in yeast and subsequently in mammals, and now the field exploded, and that's why he got the Nobel Prize. But it's a great article to go through all of that. It's pretty cool. Uh, and the other was I looked, you know, a lot of um, news sites have reported Congress passing uh, the funding for Zika, and they all report so many million for mosquito control, so many million for vaccines, so many millions to treat people in Puerto Rico and elsewhere. But that doesn't add up to $1.1 billion. So I said, where's this money going? So I went to, f- and I actually found the bill. And I'll put a link to it. It's H.R. 5325. And uh, it's a very big bill covering many, many things. So I <laughs> They put, always are. I put a link. <laughs> you can actually put... Uh, links to different parts of the bill. And I put a link to the allocation for Zika, which will tell you that among the different allocations that I've told you, there is also uh, for NIAID, $152 million for research on the virology, natural history, and pathogenesis of Zika infection. Excellent. Basic fundamental research, cool. which nobody has mentioned. Stat, nice. you know, NPR, so hopefully that'll go into the pool of grant money, or some of it will, for uh, extramural research, and that's good. And all the, yeah. others, all the other stuff is good, too, no doubt, but this is really good because that's how you find out new things, as evidenced by the Nobel Prize. And this, these funds are, yeah, remain right. available until September 30th, 2017. Yeah. So, you know, 100, oh, oh, 152 million is uh, what? Almost a hundred R O ones. Um well if if an R O one is one point five million, yeah, yeah, it's a hundred R O one. So that could be some a lot more R twenty ones, which there have been a lot of submissions. So that's these two are tied together because you know, Osumi was just curious about autophagy. He didn't know if it was important and he took a chance and he worked on it. And you know, there are lots of aspects of Zika that look interesting. We don't know if they're important or not, and I'm glad they're putting some money into this. Yeah. All right. I think that's it. No listener picks this week. I just want to tell you about uh, one last topic from the American Society for Microbiology. They want you to know about their 2017 Scientific Writing and Publishing Online course. This is an online webinar-type course that explores scientific writing and publishing with ASM Journal editors. It's an interactive webinar. They'll cover your title, your abstract figures, legend, and the whole manuscript preparation and review process the course will take place from january through april of 2017 you have to register the deadline is december 1st you 
can find out more at bit.ly slash SWPOC17. So go over there if you're a new PI or an old PI or somewhere in between. You can always learn something about publishing because it's always changing. All right, that is TWIV410. You can find it at iTunes, microbe.tv slash TWIV. And do send your questions and comments in TWIV at microbe.tv. Think about uh, supporting the science shows of Microbe TV. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute to find out the different ways that you can do that. Our guests today are both from Florida Gulf Coast University, which has avoided the hurricane. Sharon Isern, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. And Scott Michael, thank you. Thanks, Vincent. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. It was nice to have Sharon and Scott with us. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Always a good time. And I uh, also want to say how nice it is to be with uh, Scott and Sharon again. Best of luck to both of you. And I'm happy that all three of you were not interrupted by the weather, even though we like <laughs> yeah, the weather. Yeah, I'm really... I'm really happy to have electrons coursing through my home. It's <laughs> <You> good. <laughs> yes. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. You can also find him on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure, especially when we have cool guests. Yeah, guests are good, and uh, the sound was yeah. great, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I sent them a couple of headsets, so if I just did that with uh, other people, we could have good sounding uh, guests as sure. well. There's nothing like You both sounded great, by the way. It's the headphones. Really appreciate yeah. that. Well, also good internet at your university, so that, that helps yeah, too. Good. Yeah, that was good. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the sponsors of this episode, Curiosity Stream and Drobo. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> <laughs>